Well, welcome everybody uh, to uh, a chance to to be together in the Word, and uh, and I'm thankful for the last number of weeks that we've spent together in in 40 days of prayer. The the uh, the, the advantage, uh, I guess, of of starting a year with time that is set aside to say, you know, Lord, what do you what do you have for us? We need to lean in hard. We need to lean in strong. Of course, is is in part so that. You know, he clarifies for us uh, some of where we're going and what he's doing. Because we want to be a part of what God's doing. We, we might have some ideas, we might have some plans, but we want to be a part of what he's up to. And we want to be saying yes to how he's moving and, and receiving what he's speaking. Amen? So that's one of the reasons why we have the, that time set apart. And one of the things I want to do this morning as we, we take this time together is to, is to sort of echo back what I, what I am taking away. Uh, as, as I look back at 40 days of prayer and out of all of the good and the important things that, that he, he's just sort of brought up to our attention, the question that's been on my mind is, so what is the Lord putting his finger on for us. And I don't mean to be presumptuous about that because I know that as, as you've started your year and if you've been leaning into prayer or you've been uh, really just digging into the word in a fresh way this year, I trust and, and believe that God is, is directing each of us in the way that he intends. So I'm asking this both for myself personally, but yeah, I'm also asking for us as a church, out of all of the good and the important things that uh, he's just been bringing before our attention what are the things that I just really sense that he's just putting his finger on for us. And so there's two of them that really stand out to me uh, after these, these past number of weeks. Number one is living a life of worship. And then number two is growing in a, in a, a culture of invitation. And both of those things that we, are things that we've talked about not too long ago, but if you'll bear with me, I, I want to highlight again why I think those things are, are, are what the Lord is, is doing among us now, and, or at least specifically what we mean by that. And, and so living a life of worship and growing a culture of invitation. And I want you to know that I, as I share these things again, I, I, I mean them both for you know, me as an individual, you as, as individuals, but also for us as a church family. When we've talked about living a life of worship, you, you, you know we've, we've tried to clarify that we don't just mean the, the time in the church service when we sing the songs, but the whole, the whole of our life, all of our being, our getting up and our going to bed and everything that happens in between. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but sometimes even in the middle of the night, half asleep, there's, there's opportunity to just love the Lord, to, to be a worshiper as you sleep. It's really one of my favorite parts of every day, so... <laughs> It makes sense that, you know, Lord, this is great. I love this, you know. Or, Lord, I can't sleep. Please help me, God. Please, you know, one of those two. But you cry out to God even in, in your resting hours. But when we say that we want to live a life of worship, part of the question is what do, we, what do we mean by that? And you know we've put these three words out, and I'm going to repeat them again this morning because I believe it's something that God's putting his finger on for us as a church family, too, that we would understand what we mean when we say that we want to be worshipers. And those three words simply are, are these, that we would exalt God for who he is, that we would encounter the presence of the Lord, and that we would learn to express our love for him. That we, that we grow in our ability to be more expressive of that, whatever that looks like, and we're not intending to or presuming to, to, to um, prescribe what it ought to look like, but that we would grow in our expression. And as we've shared in weeks past, we exalt God in our worship because we know the Lord is God. It's just very simple that he's the Lord and he's worthy of exaltation. He's the truth. He's the center. He's the holy one. He's right and he's good and he's pure. And all of creation was created for his glory. We were made to exalt the Lord. And it's what we'll be doing for all of eternity. And if you're someone who goes, well, huh, that sounds... Great. <laughs> and you worry a little bit maybe about, well, well, won't we get tired of that? Or won't we, well, you know, will the song get old? Or, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever our concerns. Maybe they get. All I can say is just trust me. When we see God 
face to face, what we'll learn is that not only is he infinitely greater than anything we've ever imagined, but God in his creative nature, God in his ever increasing glory and majesty will never get to the point where we've, we've understood the fullness of who he is. There's always more to discover, always more to take in. And I believe that even in somehow, I don't understand this mystery, but I believe that even in, in eternity, that God in his creative nature will constantly be unfolding greater and sweeter and deeper and more profound and more beautiful and more exciting things that we'll get to take in together. So trust me, brothers and sisters, we won't be disappointed in the presence of God in eternity. But I promise you this, that it's all about giving him the glory and the honor and the love that he's due. We will be forever exalting the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so we exalt him simply because we know the Lord is God and there's no other. We, we want to encounter the Lord in worship too because, because Jesus, as we've talked about this morning, has made this incredible promise even as he was leaving the, 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 his physical feet on this soil, he was making this promise, I will never actually leave you. I will never actually be away from you. And, and, it, and there's, there's this, this strange and, and wonderful mystery that even in the same discourse when he was saying, I'm going away and where you, where you or where I'm going, you can't follow. And the same discourse he's also saying but I'm going to be with you the whole time I'm sending you another who's who's me he's my spirit and and and, and I'm doing this so that I'm going to be with you and in you in a way that it, it, it is even greater if, if it's if it's possible to even imagine even greater than the physical presence of the Lord God Almighty standing on a spot on the earth, he says, no, I'm going to be with you and in you by my spirit. And I will never leave you. You will never be without me. And then the promises of scripture that, that hold this promise together, that, that when we gather in his name, he's there in the midst. When we call out, he comes quickly. There's so many things that he, that, uh, the promise that he inhabits our praises, that he lives with us as we exalt him. I mean, the point that we're making is that, that God has always come to be with us and therefore it's our desire to encounter him in worship. That when we worship the Lord, we're, 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 this is not a transaction only where we, where we give glory to the one who deserves the glory. That's true but also that we encounter him, that we spend time with him, that we recognize his presence, that we lean in, that we learn to listen, that we love him, that, that we recognize he's here with us and, and, our, and our hearts and his are connecting together in this moment. We, we exalt the Lord because the Lord is God. And as Jess Langdon said the other week, that, that's putting everything in its rightful place under him. But we desire to encounter him because he's near. We want to be changed by the one who's outside of ourselves, who is the answer and is present. And then thirdly, we, we want to express. We want to grow in our expression simply because he's wonderful. And that's what we do when we find wonderful things. What we love, we talk about, as was said the other, the other week. We, we, we like to say what we love. We, we, we watch what we love. We enjoy what we love. And I think we thrive in what we love. We grow in what we love. And, and, and it's, it's our heart not just to exalt him or to encounter him, but to grow in our expression, to grow in our ability to, to say so, to deepen our our confidence that he's worth the expression. He's worth the joy on our face. He's worth the joy in our voice. He's worth the song on our lips. 
He's worth our hands in the air. He's worth our hands clapped together. He's worth our knees on the ground. He's worth our silence in reverence. He's worth our confession as we walk into his presence. He's worth our passion, whatever that might look like for your personality. It doesn't matter. All that you are, he's worth it. What we want to learn to do is learn how to express it. Now, the reason why we put those three words out, even though they might be obvious, and well, sure, that's exactly what we do, is because we are recognizing that if we lack any of those things, we're leaving out an essential part, and our worship becomes skewed and imbalanced, and not the way that it was designed. If, if, if we're not exalting God for who he is, then what we're worshiping is ourselves, and the way that we feel comfortable doing this thing. If we're not exalting God for who he is, then we are probably making him out to be in our own image. And you hear this, you hear this sometimes in the language of the culture. Well, I couldn't believe in a God who, or the God that I believe in is, you know, or on any kind of way that, that that's said. But really what we mean by that is that my idea of who God should be is who God is. But the fact is, the truth is, and you know this is right, that God is who he is, whether we see it or not, say it or not, believe it or not, or like it or not. We don't change who God is by what we like or what we think he should be or the way that we wish he would do things. I appreciated hearing from a, a dear friend just this past week who I, th I thought shared in a very personal and vulnerable and profound way. Sometimes I don't agree with God. And I need to be able to just admit that. God, I don't really like the way you decided to do something but you're still God and I'm not going to worship you for who I want you to be I want to know you and worship you for who you really are and I believe that the more I get to know you the more you reconcile those things in me which don't quite get it yet and so you see if we don't exalt God for who he is in his truth in his holiness in his majesty in all of his character and his attributes if we don't exalt God for who he is, then really what we're worshiping is ourselves. If we're not encountering the Lord in our worship, if, we, if we're convinced that we know who God is and what he's like and, and we want to get the truth right and we want to do the right thing, we want to do it the right way, but we're not interested in encountering the presence of the Lord, then what we're left with is just religion. Doing the right thing, believing the right thing making sure that we've got everything lined up in the way it is. But if we're not interested in encountering the Lord when he's present, then, then we're, we're left with religion. And I'm not interested. It satisfies for a little while, and it might make us feel like we're doing the right thing or we're a good person or whatever. But in the end, it always comes up empty and dry. And you know what? Religion without the presence of God hurts people. And our entire culture and our whole world and every generation is littered with the damage done by people who believe religion without the presence of God. And I say that and I feel, I feel conviction. I feel challenged. I feel pushed, right? And I hope that you do too because, because it's easy to accidentally it's easy to unintentionally, it's easy by habit or routine to go through things that we believe are right and even have right doctrine ourselves and forget this is all about encountering the Lord. Yeah? And if we worship without expression, then simply put, we're, we're being stuck, we're being stubborn, we're going nowhere. If you're all about exalting God and you, and, you, and you are realizing and recognizing the actual presence of God, but you don't want to grow in your expression of love for him, we're stuck, we're stubborn, we're not going anywhere, we're not growing, we're not thriving, we're not becoming. So we express our love for the Lord in worship because it's part of the becoming process. It's part of the becoming more like him, which is part of the purpose of worship to begin with. So all of this to say and to recap for you and to tell you that I feel like the Lord's putting his finger on this for us so that we understand as a church and as individuals on a deeper level that when we say that we want to 
live lives of worship, what we mean by that is that we're people who exalt God for who he is, who encounter him because he's near, and are growing in our expression of love for him, all three, and all together, and as individuals and families as well. Amen? The second one was that we would grow a culture of invitation, and I want to lean in on that a little bit more this morning. Last week, I shared with you that invitation is a word that I, I think is, is our key word for understanding evangelism. There's more to it than that, but simply put, uh, I, th I think that if we can understand the call that we have to share the good news, to, to be bearers of the gospel, to be ministers of reconciliation, to walk in the call of, uh, of as the scripture says, to do the work of, the evangelist, of an evangelist, what do we mean by that? And I use this word, invitation. Uh, we want to be the kind of people and, and the kind of church that is regularly and actively saying, come and see. Come and see Jesus. And you remember last week, we took a look at four different scenes in the book of John where people were, were called to come and see Jesus. And it's, it's remarkable when you start to string them together and you see this pattern, this, 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 this beautiful picture of invitation evangelism, you know, that just says, well, do, 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 you need, do you want to have a conversation? Well, come and see. Let's have a conversation. I want to invite you into conversation. Do you need friendship? Let me invite you into friendship. Come and see. Come and see Jesus through friendship. Some people need to be just invited into worship because we tend to assume that, you know, people aren't interested or, or but that's not true. People are made for worship. People are made to gather. We're made to be a part of the family of God. And so inviting someone into a place of worship is not outlandish or crazy at all. We see pictures of that in scripture. Come and see. Come see the, the one that our hearts have longed for this whole time. And, and, and also to come and see the Lord through blessing. So when I've talked about invitation last week, invitation to conversation, invitation to friendship, invitation into worship, invitation into blessing. And these are all ways that we invite people to come and see and encounter Jesus. We, we looked at these last week through the, uh, the encounters of, uh, of Andrew as he, as he followed Jesus and Jesus welcomed him into friendship. Come and see where I'm staying. Come on, come spend time with me. You know, we saw it through, uh, through the, the Samaritans when the Samaritan woman said, come, come and see the one that we've been waiting for, the one that we've been longing for. He told me everything I ever did. He, he's the Messiah. He's the one that we've, that we've wanted to worship. Or Andrew, uh, uh, or, or rather Nathaniel, when, when uh, Philip told him, come, come and see Jesus. And they had this whole conversation through his skepticism, through his doubts and his questions and then, and then at, at Mary and Martha's family at the resurrection of, of Lazarus from the dead, Jesus invited everybody by saying, look, if you believe, you're going to see my glory. And they say, well, come and see where we've laid him. And then he said, didn't I, didn't I tell you? I told you that I, I would show you. And, uh, and, and the people got to take in and, and, and be amazed at the blessing of the presence of God there. Well, the question might be, well, how do we grow a culture of invitation. And what does that look like um, as a person, as a church? And I want to just lay out these, these three simple, very, very simple thoughts. Pray, prepare, and invite. Pray, prepare, and invite. If you have a Bible with you, open up to Mark chapter 1. And we're just going to look at uh, a couple verses in Mark 1 and some more in, in Mark 2. Familiar stories and don't take a lot of explanation, but I just want you to see this with me here this morning. Pray, prepare, and invite. That's how we build a culture of invitation for people to come and see Jesus. There's a story that I want to share with you here in a moment, one that's familiar to you about Jesus healing a paralyzed man. But one of the cool things about the book of Mark is that um, we get a sense, because of the pace at which Mark tells the, the story, we get a sense of how really quickly everything moved. You know, uh, when you, when you, uh, then there's breaking news um, in, the, in the town or in the country or in the world. You know, those first news stories come out quickly and feverishly, and they don't necessarily have all of the details yet. There's more to be discovered and unfolded, but that initial breaking news report kind of hits these highlights and hits them quickly, and, 
And that's sort of like what Mark's gospel is. It's like the breaking news gospel where uh, quickly he moves through the story and then later the others sort of fill out some more of the details and the perspective and provide more insight and, and um, you know, more interest to the, uh, more stories uh, about the whole unfolding of Jesus' life. But the truth is, is that the people who follow Jesus experience everything that we know about the Gospels in a very short period of time. And so for them, a lot of it really did kind of come rapid fire. And I appreciate that when you read Mark. And, and so right away when you start the if you, if you start to read the, the book of Mark, you know, things are happening very quickly and very early in the, in the very first chapter, as things are happening very quickly, in verse 35, here's what we read about Jesus. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. And Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. This is why I have come. And so they traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Just a few paragraphs earlier, uh, Jesus, uh, or Mark uh, paints the, the, the quickly unfolding story of, of Jesus being baptized by John and then being led into the desert and, 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 and tested for 40 days. And then he comes back and he says, okay, now the time has come. And he starts to, he starts to share the, the good news of the kingdom. And he tells people, repent, the kingdom of God is, is here. And he's talking about himself. I'm here. I'm, the king. I'm bringing the kingdom. Here I am. And, uh, and then people begin to follow and, and, uh, and, and he's healing people and crowds are gathering. And so now he comes to this spot where he goes away and he prays. In fact, one of the things that happened was that he, had heal he healed a man of leprosy and he told the man, don't, don't go telling everyone this yet. Uh, but the man didn't listen, went and told everybody. And so, uh, and so all of a sudden the crowds grew much, much faster. Um, and uh, and so, th so that's where we find Jesus pulling away because the crowds have grown very large, very quick. And so he goes up early in the morning to pray. And, and I want you to notice that it's, 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 it's the first thing he does before the ministry continues and, and his disciples come and find him and, and they say, everyone's looking for you. Jesus, there's so much to be done. There's so many people that are, are looking for you. And, and isn't it interesting that his response to everyone is looking for you is, let's go somewhere else. <laughs> I can relate to that, really. If there's a, you know... Hey, everyone's doing, everyone's gathering over here. I admit, there is something in me, the way that I'm wired, I go, great, let me go somewhere else. <laughs> but Jesus, how did he know how to go somewhere else? How did he know when the disciples said, hey, everyone's looking for you. There are so many people that want to be where you are, that, that want to hear what you have to say and that want healing or whatever. There's so many people that are looking for you. How did he know to not just go to where the, all those people are? He, he knew because he had just spent that time with the Father. He knew because he had just taken that time away to go pray and ask the Lord, what do, you, what do you have for me today? What do you want me to do? There's a lot of people that wanted to see him, and, and he cared about them. In fact, he comes back to them in just a, a, a moment here in the story. But the first thing he did at, at, that, at that time was to say, we need to go somewhere else because there's other villages and other people and other towns where people need to hear the gospel that, we're, that, I'm, that I'm preaching. And so the simple point, but the profound point is this. There's always much to do. Sometimes we get overwhelmed and we think, man, there's, there's people I work with. There's people I live with in my neighborhood. There's people I'll go to school with. And, you know, I've, I'm serving in this way and I've got this on my calendar. And, and I'm, I'm busy and I'm trying and I'm, I'm trying to do all the things that God's, I think God's given me to do. And it feels overwhelming sometimes. But let's just remember this example from Jesus as he pulled away to pray and said, Lord, what do you have for me today? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? There's always much to do, but there's nothing worth doing unless God's the one who's doing it. That's really what it comes down to. And once again, I feel that sense of conviction because there's always a lot to do, but there's really nothing worth doing unless God's the one doing it. Or, or as Psalm 127, 1 would put it, you've heard this, that unless the, the, the Lord builds the house, the builders build in vain. Or unless the Lord watches the city, the watchmen are staying awake in vain. And the point is, 
Sure, there's houses that need to be built. Sure, the city needs to be watched. Sure, there's people looking for Jesus. But unless he's doing what God wants done in that moment and he's in the right place at the right time, he's doing it in vain. And that's Jesus. So the same is true for you and me, of course. There's a lot of people that need a lot of things. And there's a lot of important things worth doing. And we want to have that culture of invitation that's always ready and always responsive. But it makes sense that the first step is always, always to pray. If we're going to grow a culture of invitation, we have to be people who are willing to pray and ask God, who are the people that you want me to share with? Who are the people that you want to extend this invitation to through me? Well, let me read the, the, um, the story that begins in, in chapter 2. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. And some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then lowered the mat the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? That would have been an unsettling moment. (laughs) Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Wow. What a scene. I mean, what a story. It's familiar maybe to you, but can we take a a few minutes to to spend some time here? As, As some men came, bringing him a paralyzed man... You know, one of the things that I always assume about this, and until I just take a little bit of time to slow down and read what it says and notice what it doesn't say, I always think of it as four guys carrying this, this man in. And, and, and maybe it was four, but I, if you read carefully, you see that there were some men that brought this man to Jesus, and four of them were carrying him. So I don't know how many there were. There may have been a group of Five or six or eight or ten or twenty. I don't know. But four of them were carrying him. And it's a remarkable scene. I mean, if you don't know anything else about the story, just imagine this crowd coming to see Jesus at this home. And here come a group of men carrying one. And I don't know, maybe if there's a bunch of them, they're rotating, you know. I would think. It depends on how far they've come, how heavy the dude is. I don't know. But, you know, there are four of them carrying the guy, and and there's this group of men, and don't you have all kinds of questions about how this came to be? Probably they had heard about Jesus, they heard about the things that he was doing, and and you would think that, that here's someone that they care about deeply, someone who's very important to them. As a paralyzed man, he was laying on this mat, and and, uh, boy, I, I mean, I the way that I am, I start thinking through like, well, what was the hardware like? What was the, did they, what kind of knots did they use? Were they carrying them on a sheet? Or was it like, how do they carry them on a sheet without bunk, bunking their heads together? You know, like, I just, that's how I think. I think about the mechanics of it. I don't know how it worked, but I know that these guys somehow had some kind of conversation where they really didn't know all that much. All they knew is, We really, really care about this guy, and we heard that's the guy to get him to. And whatever it takes for us to get him there, let's do it. And so maybe let's just picture a group of, say, 10 guys decide that Jerry, 
I don't know if his name is Jerry. <laughs> Jerry, we're taking you to Jesus. And what does Jerry think? Does Jerry think, great, please take me. Maybe he was the one asking them, please take me to Jesus. I can't get to him myself. Or maybe he was like, Look, guys, that's, that's so embarrassing. Like, please, and well, you're paralyzed and you can't do anything about it. And they take him anyways. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But I'm just, I like to imagine these things. I wonder what it was like because they have had to have some conversation about this. We're taking you to Jesus. And along the way, what's the guy feeling? What's the guy thinking? What's it going to be like? And then what happens when you get there and you see a massive crowd and you realize we're not getting anywhere close to Jesus? But they prepared, didn't they? Not just the mat and the ropes and the root and whatever it is they do, the rotation of guys who carry each of the four corners. But clearly, they had a relationship together. Where they had prepared this relationship in a way that they could say, Jerry, we're taking you to Jesus. Or that he knew, would you guys take me? And it was there. And here's the point that I'm making. Jesus has put us each in spaces and places full of relationships. And when we take the time to pray and ask the Lord, what is it? There's a lot of important things that I could be doing. There's a lot of important things that I see that need to happen, even for your glory. But none of them matter if you're not the one doing it. So I'm praying and I'm asking. And then start to prepare those relationships for the opportunity to give an invitation to come and see Jesus. I believe that he's asking for us to prepare our relationships. You know, so maybe that looks like, uh, you know, just taking care of a need. Maybe it looks like just nurturing the friendship. Maybe it looks like an offer to say, wow, that sounds really hard. I I'm going to be praying for you. Or can I pray for you now? Or whatever, however the Lord leads you because you've prayed about it. But he's asking for us to prepare our relationships. See, I, I want for us to be prepared as a church for the people who aren't here yet. It's important that we take care of the things around this campus and that we learn to communicate well and we provide places for people to connect and grow and we do a good job of welcoming guests and newcomers and all of the things that we want to do well. But more important than preparing the place is preparing the relationships. And that's something that happens all week long wherever he's planted us. Well, there was no room. And one of the, one of the, uh, the saddest parts of the story is there in, in verse 2 where he says there was no room. And then, and then in verse 4, they could not get him to Jesus because of a crowd. There are a lot of reasons why people can't get to Jesus. And you could say it's because of a crowd. You could say it's because of hurt. It could, you could say it's because of some preformed idea or or fear, or whatever it is that they have in their story. There's a lot of things that keep people from him. But don't you appreciate, in this relationship, that, that, that if there was no room, we're going to make room. And if there's something in the way between you and Jesus, then we're going to find a way. We're going to make a way. Because clearly, these guys had it in their minds that we don't know what's going to happen. We just know that great things will happen if we can get this man that we love in front of Jesus. And so they would make room. They would make a way. And they start digging away at the tiles. And, and you've probably heard about how, you know, the houses and everything are constructed. And so they're up there on the roof. And there's, there's tiles and mud. And they're mixed together. And, and, and you maybe can see them, you know, trying to figure out how to, how to get this stuff apart. And they're reaching down, pulling the tiles off, scraping the mud away. And then they start to lower them down. And... Uh, don't you think, like, how rude? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not very nice to the homeowner. But there's a whole crowd of people, and Jesus is in the middle of talking. And they're all listening to him. And the way that they just sort of say, well, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Have you noticed that Jesus kind of likes it when people get a little pushy? You know, it's not rude. It's not rudeness. But he's not that worried about being polite either, is he? If that's what it takes to get people to Jesus, he's okay with it. He doesn't mind that there's a woman that's pushing people aside saying, I've just got to touch him, I've just got to touch him. And she touches the hem of his garment and instantly is healed. 
or, or a, a, a blind man on the side of the road, and every, Jesus is walking by, and he starts screaming, and everyone's like, would you please be quiet? We're having a thing here. And he just screams all the louder, and he says, no, 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 stop. I want to I wanna talk to him. He doesn't mind that at all. Or the little kids that come to him, and everyone's saying, get out of here, kids. Come on. You know, church, children's church is over there. And, and he says, no, 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 let them come to me. Like, he just doesn't mind when we're a little pushy to get people in front of him, does he? And I love that, that as they pull apart the tiles and the mud and they lower them down, everything stops. Even though he was doing and saying exactly what he was supposed to, everything stops. And the, the passage says that he saw their faith. He saw their faith and he loved it, didn't he? He loved it and he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. And you heard the other part of the story as the, as the Pharisees and everyone was thinking, well, you can't do that. How unnerving would it be? Right? Does it, you, know, you didn't say anything. And Jesus looks at you and says, why are you thinking that? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, know, I, I, know what the, I know what the man needs. I know what the man needs. But I want you to know also that I have authority to forgive sins. And so he said, get up and take your mat and walk. He saw their faith and he loved it. So I'm putting these thoughts together as I think about uh, my own life and our individual lives and the places and the people that we're called to, that we're surrounded with. I think about us as a church family, and I just sense that God's putting his finger on this, that we would live lives of worship and that we understand what that means and that we would continue to grow together a culture of invitation that's always prayerfully preparing relationships and looking for the opportunities even if we have to be a little pushy, not against the people, but against the thing that we think should be happening next. And we do anything we can to get people in front of Jesus. And the thing that I, I really appreciate about this is that these guys, for all we know, it doesn't really seem like they, that they've known Jesus long, that they had a sense of what he would do. I don't know what they would have thought when he, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. That's the first thing out of his mouth. And, you know, they, they probably didn't load the guy up on the mat, carry him the whole way there so that his sins could be forgiven. That's probably not what they were thinking, right? They just knew that, that whatever, whatever happens when we, when we get this man that we love in front of Jesus, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be good. It's going to be right. This is what he needs. We got to get this guy in front of that guy. And I hope that we can grow together in a culture of invitation that would pray to have eyes to see people the way that God sees them, that would prepare our relationships and even be willing to get a little pushy before the throne room and say, God, you've got, you've got to see. Come and see, my friend. Come and see my neighbor. And meanwhile, we're telling our friend, our neighbor, come and see Jesus. You see, if we're worshiping and we know what that looks like, exalting, encountering, expressing, then we won't be able to help having a life that's always inviting people in to that same joy. Amen? I just think that God's putting his finger on that for us as a church. Well, before we leave the story and wrap this up for today. Can we just see the man for a moment in the middle of the story? The man who was paralyzed and, and um, boy, maybe he was so desperate that he was just, whatever it takes, just bring me to him. Or maybe he felt a little humiliated uh, maybe that's too strong, but I would have struggled. I know that. I would have had a hard time being the guy that's being carried in. And when we get there to see the crowd, I would have absolutely been like, okay, there's a big crowd. Let's just stay on the outskirts. <laughs> maybe we'll catch him later. And I have those guys say, no, 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 we're getting you in there. Yeah, I know, but he's talking and he's, he's, he's taking care of people and whatever. No, 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 we're getting you in there. I would have struggled with that. I know it. But there they were and they, they pulled apart those tiles and those, that mud and they, they lowered him down. And, and to hear Jesus say those words to him, probably the last thing he expected to hear, son, your sins are forgiven. 
I can't even imagine. One of the things that we know is true about the culture is that when people had certain diseases or illnesses or disabilities, especially if they were born with them or, or if there was an accident or something like that, that the culture really assumed that it was because of something you did. It was because you've sinned against God. There's something wrong with you. He's displeased with you. And Jesus corrected that thinking in some ways, but also pointed out sometimes when there's a, there's a connection. But I wonder if the guy is, has, has felt that, has felt that weight. And to have, have this moment, which is, which is totally surreal and maybe completely overwhelming, where now he's being lowered down into the presence of Jesus, and Jesus sees the faith of all of these men and says, son, your, your sins are forgiven. I just think it probably would have been the most beautiful, wonderful thing he has ever heard and didn't expect to hear at all. And then to get away and walk as well is just the greatest bonus of all time. But what would it have been like for him for the rest of his life to have had an encounter with Jesus where the thing that he needed most of all and first of all wasn't even what he came for, but Jesus gave it to him anyways. Your sins are forgiven. You and me, we're okay. We're okay. You and God, the, the slate is clean. The slate is clear. Your sins are forgiven. And you know what else? Go ahead and take up your mat and walk. And a lot of that happened because someone was willing to, to, to do whatever it takes to bring him there. When we think about what God has done for us and all that we have to thank him for, forgiving our sins, healing our lives, restoring our relationship with him, and the countless other things that we've seen him do and answer our prayers. Doesn't it fill us with the desire to let people come and see the same Jesus that we love? It does. But there's one more thing. I always think about those guys, and I admire them, and their tenacity and their boldness to start pulling away the tiles and scraping away the mud. And I think, what great friends. I had a thought I've never thought about before uh, until this time reading this story, that I wonder as they are pulling the tiles and they're scraping the mud and they lower him down and they hear the words, son, your sins are forgiven. I wonder if they might think, I wish I were down there. I, I need that. I thought my paralyzed friend was the needy, the needy one. And I thought that his main need was that he couldn't walk, but really, his main need was that he needed his sins forgiven. I need my sins forgiven. And I wonder, like, do they want to just crawl down there as well? So I just want to encourage us today that yeah. your soul was made to have a clean, clear, beautiful, loving relationship with Jesus. That's right. and, and there are times when we have to sort of pull away tiles and scrape away mud and, and, and make room, make space, so that that soul of ours that longs for connection and relationship with the Lord can get right before him yeah. and hear the words that we need to hear and live in that restored relationship. So I want to encourage you that that's exactly what Jesus wants for you too, not just the people that we're trying to love and invite, but for you too. And if there's anything that he puts his finger on that's worth just tearing out, sliding aside, clean, push away, so that there's room for you to encounter him personally, trust me, friend, it's exactly what he wants for you too. So go ahead and do it. Yeah. Jesus, we love you. We're amazed by you when we see you interacting with people. You, you do things that we, just, we would never see coming if we hadn't heard the story. I want to thank you, Jesus, that in that moment, even though you knew what everyone was thinking, you did not first say, take up your mat and walk. But you said what this man needed to hear more than anything, more than he even knew. 
Lord, I know that there's, there's friends and there's neighbors and there's family members, there's people that we care about, people in, with whom we're in relationship that need, that need to know you. And we want to have that culture of invitation. Lord, grow that in us personally, grow that in us as a church. But Lord, let us ourselves meet you too. Let us ourselves encounter you too. Help us to clean and clear away whatever is in the way and, uh, and make room for you to speak to us the things that we need to hear from you directly the most. And I know, Lord, that as we encounter you, we will desire that for others. And you'll lead us just right. Thank you for your love for us and this world in which we live. Help us to be more like you and to draw people to you. In your name, amen.